without further ado, we'll just get into uh, listening to one of the most important people uh, in the Indian policy frame. Uh, he is Dr. Bibek De Broy. Uh, in fact, just to introduce Dr. De Broy, uh, I've known Dr. De Broy as an uh, individual or somebody who was a public figure for the last 30 years. When I was growing up as a PhD student, I used to read his articles. And, uh, for, uh, and we met about 10 years back. And I think as a person, he's just one of the most accomplished economists you'll ever meet. But if you do not know, uh, he is one of the foremost Sanskrit scholars in the country as well. So that is one hat that he wears. So as an accomplished economist, without a doubt, he works as the chairman of the Economic Advisory Council. But he's also one of the biggest translators of big works of Sanskrit. Uh, he has translated close to about uh, 5 million words or something like this. And it's just amazing work that he has done. Uh, so that is uh, who he is as a person, has authored close to about 70 books. Uh, his accomplishments are many, but one of the biggest accomplishments that he's actually had is that he's a co-author with me and he writes a column with me. Uh, so, <laughs> so that is where it is. So uh, everything else is okay, but this is the most important one. Uh, but uh, Dr. Devroy, uh, it's an honor and a privilege for us to have you all the way from India. Uh, over to you, sir, please. Namaste and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first thank Richard Dasher and Amit Kapoor for having invited me to Stanford for this India Dialogue. Obviously, it has an India-US focus. Otherwise, dialogue might have been spelt differently with a U and a E. <laughs> I have about 20 minutes to describe what has been going on in India, what is likely to happen in India in the next 10 years, which is a difficult task. It's a large country. It is a heterogeneous country. The different states and union territories are at different levels of development. These are exciting times to be in India. These are exciting times for Indians. These are exciting times for anyone interested in India. As the Consul General's remarks also indicate, There are different ways I could have utilized these 20 minutes. For example, I could have talked about the rates of growth that one is likely to see in India over the next 10 years or so. I could have spoken about the size of the economy in terms of the official exchange rates or PPP exchange rates. I could have spoken about the reduction in poverty this leads to. A recent UNDP document based on the multidimensional poverty index documents the large reduction in the number of people below the poverty line over the last decade or so. I could have spoken about improvements in human development indicators. But much of this stuff is available readily on the net. Much of this is available in the form of dashboards that the government puts out. So instead of that, I'm going to focus and draw your attention to seven transitions that have been going on in India. These seven transitions have been going on in the past, and they are certain to continue in the future. What are these seven transitions? The first transition that's been happening is in an acceleration in the rate of urbanization. Throughout the world, Urbanization is correlated with economic development. Urbanization is desirable. 
historically India has had relatively low rates of urbanization. Compared not only with the so-called advanced countries, compared also with countries like China and Brazil. Those rates of urbanization have picked up sharply. There is a definition of urban in terms of the census. It does not truly capture, for various reasons I do not need to get into, the extent to which this urbanization has been happening. The level of urbanization, according to some definitions, not the census one, in India now is pretty close to 45%. Of course, there are challenges in terms of managing this urbanization. There are challenges because in a country like India, rare is the case where you will have a completely greenfield city. Most of this urbanization is brownfield urbanization. And there are government programs, the Smart Cities Mission, other programs also to ensure this urbanization is better managed. The second transition I want to mention is a transition that involves a greater degree of formalization of the economy. Formalization, again, is desirable. And I'm not going to get into the taxonomy of definitions about what is informal and what is unorganized. But encouraged by several government policies, there are two kinds of formalization that are taking place. Firstly, enterprises are getting more formal. We talk in India or we talk globally about MSME. Most of MSME in India has not been registered traditionally under any statutory law. 95 to 97% of the informal sector has not been recognized legally. I don't mean the Companies Act. Obviously, this leads to problems. And because of various government initiatives, the formalization of enterprises has started to happen. Other than the formalization of enterprises, there is a question of more workers moving into the formalized sector. More workers having formal labor contracts, even if they are part of the informal system. Increasingly, that has begun to happen. The third transition I want to mention is a transition that is within agriculture. It's a double kind of transition. Firstly, a movement of the labor force away from agriculture to off-farm employment opportunities. And the second kind is when you are on the farm, increasing employment not in conventional food grain production, but in commercialization and diversification, producing commercial crops, here the issue is not only that of production and increasing productivity, and productivity levels in India are fairly low. Many land holdings tend to be fairly small. It is also an issue of marketing and distribution. In a country like India, to state the obvious in case the obvious is not realized always, it's a federal country with some subjects in the state list some subjects in the concurrent list of the constitution and some subjects in the union government list. One of the ways to look at sources of productivity growth in India is to slice it in terms of what every economist would do, which is to look at land markets, labor markets, capital markets, and the rest is productivity. In other words, look at the factor markets. And so far as the factor markets are concerned, Land is entirely a state subject. Labor is on the concurrent list. 
Consequently, definitions of land are, con are, are important in terms of defining who is a farmer. And many of the agricultural reforms that one is talking about are reforms that are contingent on what the state government is doing. The fourth kind of transition is a linked transition, and this is a transition from self-employment, which is often subsistence level, to an employer-employee kind of relationship, where the interests of the workers are even better protected than under that subsistence level self-employment. Over and above these four transitions, let me now mention three other transitions. And just as background, and the Consul General hinted at it, the entire world, not just India, went through a turbulent time because of a completely exogenously imposed shock, which is that of COVID. And compared to the dire prognosis that was stated for a country like India faced with something like the pandemic, regardless of the metric that he used, India has performed remarkably well. Whether it is in terms of infections, whether it is in terms of mortality, once you normalize for population, whether it is in terms of vaccination, the success has been phenomenal. And one reason this success has been phenomenal is linked to the fifth transition that I want to mention, which is something that received a great deal of extra focus under the Narendra Modi government, by which I do not merely mean the government that came into formation in 2019, but the government that was formed in 2014, because whatever has been happening under the second Narendra Modi government is a continuation of whatever happened under the first Narendra Modi government. And what I'm flagging now is the provision of basic necessities. Whether it is physical infrastructure, whether it is social infrastructure, whether it is the provision of toilets, gas supply, housing, electricity, toilets, sanitation, sewage treatment, and now water for everyone through the tap. Not only is this provision of basic necessities desirable, purely because it improves the lives of people who are not that well off, it also leads to a tremendous degree of empowerment. One example of that being in the area of financial inclusion. It leads to integration. It leads to removal of asymmetry in information. For instance, the number of bank accounts that have been opened is phenomenal. The direct benefit transfers that are being directly transferred to these bank accounts is phenomenal. Linked to this is the sixth transition, which again the Consul General mentioned in passing, which is that of a digital India. That digital India is backed up by a publicly supported, publicly funded, publicly provided digital public infrastructure. One instance of that is something that all of you are familiar with, which is the Aadhaar card. But it's much more than the Aadhaar card. There is a complete India stack which incorporates all kinds of elements of that digital infrastructure. Quite often, it is easier to relate to something like this if you recount an anecdote. So I realize the time constraint. Nevertheless, I would like to relate this anecdote because it is illustrative. In Delhi, there are some old ruins in a place known as Suraj Kund. 
Recently, I went there to visit these ruins protected by the Archaeological Survey of India. And there is an entry fee of 15 rupees. So I reached for my wallet. And the guard said, we are not allowed to accept cash. <laughs> so I produced my credit card. He said, sorry, the credit card reader is not working. <laughs> so I said, now what do we do? My driver, who's a government driver, was hearing this conversation. And he said, in Hindi, I am Paytm kar deta hu. I'm going to pay using Paytm. The extent to which something like this has happened, partly facilitated by the spread of smartphones, is phenomenal. And the Consul General may mentioned UPI. The number of UPI transactions now is phenomenal. Earlier, what used to happen through money orders, remittances being sent by migrants, it's moved to a completely different plane altogether. And the last transition that I want to mention is linked to the others, which is an enormous amount of improvement in transport connectivity. Roads and highways are the most palpable illustration of that. It's happened for civil aviation. It's happening for railways. The entire country is getting integrated. Yes, startups. Yes, unicorns. But unicorns and startups are a slice of what is happening in India, the top end of that slice. If you travel to India, and I hope you do as part of the India Dialogue, if you travel to India from the north to the south, from the west to the east, from, from the snow-capped tips of the Himalayas in Kashmir to the south in Kanyakumari, where the ocean laps its tongue against the shore, from the arid, salty deserts of Gujarat to the lush green fields of Arunachal Pradesh, you will sense a vibrant India, a turbulent India, an aspirational India, an India that is on the move, an entrepreneurial India. That, I think, is what this India dialogue is also about, to realize that this is what is happening in India. Thank you once again for having invited me. Namaste.